Good evening aspirants, I have an important announcement for you. The much awaited pre-storming batch 6 is about to start. There are 25 tests in this test series and the first test is about to commence on 5th March 2023. All the tests will be conducted in both online and offline mode. See this test series has been specifically designed to help experienced aspirants because there is no sectional test in this test series. All the tests will be subject wise full test. There will be 22 subject wise full test and 3 mock test at the end. So aspirants looking to challenge themselves, please opt for this test series. It will be very useful for your lips examination. With this news, let us get to the Hindu news analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 27th of February 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles we will be going through today. Now, without wasting much time, let's take up the first article for our discussion. Have a look at this article taken from the yesterday's newspaper. It is regarding the linkage of India's UPA and Singapore's PayNo. As you all already know, UPA based digital payment ecosystem of India helps in real time fund transfer from one bank account to another. This real-time fund transfer system has now been extended to the country of Singapore through the linking up with the Singapore's digital payment system called PayNow. The article given here talks about the benefits of this recent linkage of the two countries' digital payment system. This is what is given in this article. So, in our discussion today, let us see the important points discussed in this article. First, let us learn about the term real-time payments. Real-time payments are payments where money transfer is settled as soon as the transfer is initiated. Generally, real-time payments are available 24 bar 7. Take the case of UPI. It allows for uninterrupted digital transfer of money from one bank account to another round the clock. UPI is an example of real-time payment system. Real-time payment system helps to simplify the process of fund transfer as well as ease the communication between the payer and the payee. This is all about real-time payments. Now let us move on to see about the new agreement between India and Singapore for the use of UPA for cross-country payments. Last month, the National Payment Corporation of India allowed international phone numbers to be able to transact using UPA. This announcement followed by the new agreement between India and Singapore has now enabled the usage of UPA outside India. This would benefit the Indian migrant workers and students who are living in Singapore to transfer money back and forth from Singapore to India and vice versa. Now let us see about the working of this cross-border payment system. This cross-border payment system involves banks located in both the countries. Some particular banks are selected in both the countries where this new system will be operationalized. For users within India, the State Bank of India, Indian Overseas Bank, Indian Bank and ICICI Bank will facilitate both inward and outward remittances. These are local Indian banks who are going to be part of the wider transnational UPA ecosystem. Now coming to the banks of Singapore. In Singapore, DBS Singapore and Liquid Group, which is a fintech company, will facilitate the service for users in Singapore. This is how the cross-border payment system will work. Here note that account holders of listed banks can transfer fund to and fro from India and Singapore using their UPA ID, mobile number or virtual payment address. Okay. Also know that Indian government is planning to allow UPA remittances from other countries like the United Arab Emirates, Oman and Saudi Arabia in the future. This is being done keeping in mind that these countries host a large number of Indian migrant workers. Moving forward, let us see the benefits associated with cross-border UPA payments. The benefit includes swiftness, fastness, less transaction charges and no requirement for special intermediaries like Western Union. Other than these benefits, internationalization of UPA ecosystem shows the world that high level of innovation that is taking place in India regarding the field of financial technology. That's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we came to know about the term real-time payments, the recent agreement allowing cross-border UPA payments between India and Singapore and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the benefits associated with cross-border UPA payments. Now let us conclude this discussion. 
and take up the next news article. Look at this article. It appeared on the science page in yesterday's newspaper. It talks about neutrinos. In order to understand that, you must first understand a little bit about the standard model theory. So, in this discussion, we will understand the basics of the standard model theory. Then we will see about neutrinos in detail. Fine. Look at this image. It gives a broad understanding about the standard model theory. So, this standard model theory talks about the basic building blocks of matter and how they are governed by the three fundamental forces of nature. Basically, the elementary particles occur in two basic types called quarks and leptons. Each of these consists of six particles. There is a group of six quarks and six leptons. The six quarks are paired in three generations. In the first generation, we have up quark and down quark. In the second generation, we have charm quark and strange quark. And in the third generation, we have top quark and bottom or beauty quark. Similarly, leptons are arranged in three generations. They are the electrons and the electron neutrino, the muons and the muon neutrino, and finally tau and tau neutrino. Here note that these three, that is electron neutrino, muon neutrino and tau neutrino are three different types of neutrinos. Each of the particles here, that is leptons and quarks, have its own antiparticle. See, an antiparticle is something which has the same mass as the particle, but it has an opposite charge. For example, an antiparticle for electron is positron. And here positron has equal mass as the electron, but it has opposite charge. That is, positron is positively charged. So, the standard model contains 12 quarks and 12 leptons. Here the electron, muon and tau all have an electric charge and a sizable mass. But the neutrinos are electrically neutral and they have very little mass. This particular article is talking about this factor only. See, I told you antiparticles differ from the particle only in term of the charge. But neutrinos are not electrically charged, right? So, the scientific community has this question. Could neutrino be its own antiparticle? Now we will set this question aside because it is not much relevant for our exam. But we will see a little more on neutrinos. Neutrinos are the second most abundant particle in the universe. So their properties have an important influence on the structure of the universe. These particles travel at near light speed. Now how are they formed? They are formed from violent astrophysical events like exploding stars and gamma ray bursts. One interesting character of neutrinos is that they can pass through anything and everything. They can even pass through lead. If you hold your hand towards the sunlight for one second, about a billion neutrinos from the sun will pass through your hand. They have very little interaction with matter. So, this makes them incredibly difficult to detect. In order to detect neutrinos, we need very large and very sensitive detectors. Now comes the question. Why should we study neutrinos? See, I told you neutrinos interact very little with the matter around them, which means they can travel long distances without much interruptions. So, this character of neutrinos can be used in astronomy to study the different constituents of the universe. India also has a plan for a neutrino observatory in line. After this discussion, kindly search for India's quest for neutrino observatory. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we covered the basics about neutrinos. Now let us conclude this and take up the next news article. Look at this article. This question corner from science page of yesterday's newspaper attempts to answer the question, why do some people attract more mosquitoes than others? The answer to this question lies in the specialized receptors on the insect's nerve cells. These receptors on mosquitoes neurons have an important role in the insect's ability to identify people who present an attractive source of blood meal. Actually, mosquitoes detect odor through their antenna. But detecting ability is fine-tuned by these receptors. So, variations in odor, heat, humidity and CO2 are factors in attracting mosquitoes to some individuals more than others. 
For example, three different types of receptors, namely odorant, gustatory, and ionotropic receptors, are found in the surface of the neurons in Anopheles gambiae organs that detect odor. Here, this Anopheles gambiae is a mosquito which causes malaria. This is about the news article. So, in this context, let us quickly go through some of the important facts about malaria, its causes, its symptoms, the vaccine available and the steps taken by India to control the menace of malaria. Before getting into the discussion, I have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can go through it. Now, let's start our discussion. See, malaria is a mosquito-borne infectious disease caused by a various species of protozoic microorganism called plasmodium. Malaria is a disease caused by protozoan and protozoan are unicellular eukaryotic heterotropic organism. Here eukaryotes are organisms whose cell contain a nucleus and other membrane bound organelles and heterotroph is an organism that cannot produce its own food. They eat other plants and animals for energy and nutrition. So basically malaria is caused by a parasitic protozoan called plasmodium. Okay? There are four types of malaria parasite that infect humans. They are plasmodium falciparum, plasmodium vivax, plasmodium ovel and plasmodium malaria. Of these, the most common type of malaria is caused by plasmodium falciparum and it is also the most serious and the fatal kind of malaria. Now, let us quickly go through the lifestyle of the plasmodium parasite. The plasmodium enters the human body as sporocyte through the bite of the infected female anopheles mosquito. Here, sporocytes are nothing but a form of the parasite during which the parasites are infectious in nature. After entering the body, the parasites initially multiply within our liver cells. After that, they attack the red blood cells resulting in the rupture or breaking down of the red blood cells. The rupture of the RBCs is associated with the release of a toxic substance called hemozoin. These hemozoins are only responsible for the chills and high fever that reoccurs every 2 to 3 days when you are affected by malaria. Okay? Now, how do these parasites transfer from one human to another? When the female Anopheles mosquito bites an infected human, the parasite enters the mosquito's body along with the human blood that it is drinking. It is inside the mosquito's body, the actual development and maturing of the parasite happens. The parasite produced in the human body reaches the intestine of the mosquito where the female and the male cell fertilize each other leading to the formation of sporozoite. On maturing, the sporozoite breaks out of the mosquito's intestine and migrate to the salivary gland of the mosquito. Once they reach the salivary gland of the mosquito, they wait till the mosquito bites another uninfected human and the process of infection and disease begin all over again. It is interesting to note that the malaria parasite requires two hosts, that is humans and mosquitoes, to complete its life cycle. The female Anopheles mosquito is the vector for the transmission of the plasmodium parasite. There is an unanswerable question that goes like this. Which came first? Chickens or eggs? Like this question, there is no proper answer to the question, which came first? An infected person or an infected mosquito? But the cycle goes on. Malaria spreads when a mosquito becomes infected with a disease after biting an infected person and the infected mosquito then bites a non-infected person. This is about the transmission of malaria. Moving on, let us see about the causes of malaria. There are many factors that cause malaria. The first and the most common cause is the one we just saw that is getting bitten by the malaria vector that is female anopheles mosquito. Other than these most common cause, there are other causes to malaria as well. They are use of shared and infected syringes, organ transplantation from an infected person, blood transfusion from an infected person, malaria transferring from an infected mother to her baby during childbirth. Here, you must note one thing. Malaria cannot be sexually transmitted and also malaria cannot transfer from one human to another like flu or cold through sputum or air particles. 
they can only transfer from mosquito bites or the other things that we just discussed this is about the transmission of malaria moving on let us see the symptoms of malaria the symptoms of malaria are exhibited within 7 to 18 days of being infected the common symptoms are fever fatigue chills vomiting headache diarrhea anemia muscle pain sweating convulsions bloody stools and in severe case malaria can be devastating because it can lead to seizure coma and eventually death now how to prevent this malaria actually there are two ways to deal with malaria first is to prevent the mosquito bite from happening which is the preventive step or we can attack the parasites once they have infected the body in the first method people are advised to use mosquito nets and mosquito repellents this is to prevent infected vector that is the female anopheles mosquito from biting a human in the second method that is the treatment method there are two ways of treating malaria one is natural way and other one is the use of vaccine the natural way includes a chemical called quinine quinine is present in the bark of the chinchona tree it is a form of drug called chloroquine has proven effective against malaria even though it is not a vaccine and in case of vaccine the most common one is the muscurix muscurix is an injectable vaccine targeting plasmodium falciparum this vaccine was developed by gsk and it is the first and the only vaccine to show partial protection against malaria in young children the active substance in muscurix is made up of proteins found on the surface of the plasmodium falciparum parasite the vaccine aims to trigger the human immune system to defend against the first stages of malaria when the plasmodium falciparum parasite enters the human's blood stream through a mosquito bite it also helps protect against infection of liver that is hepatitis b virus other than the muscurix vaccine the other vaccine that is being developed is the r21 or matrix m vaccine this is about the prevention of malaria see you have to know that india has a high incidence of malaria and it is committed to eliminate malaria by 2030 so india to reduce its disease burden has taken various steps to counter malaria now let us see the steps taken by india to counter malaria the first one is the national vector borne disease control program it was launched in 2003 by merging the national anti malaria control program national filaria control program and the kala azar control programs under the program malaria control was integrated with other vector borne disease as all these disease share common control strategies after this we initiated the national strategic plan for malaria elimination the plan period was 2017 to 2020 under the plan the country has been stratified into four categories based on the malaria burden the categories are 0 1 2 1 3 each category has been given different targets to eradicate the disease after that in 2016 we formed the national framework for malaria elimination under this framework india plans to eliminate malaria by 2030 by eliminating malaria nationally india is aiming to improve health quality of life and address poverty in the country the last one is the malaria elimination research alliance india that is mira india it is launched by indian council for medical research it is an conglomeration of partners working on malaria control the aim of this alliance is to harness and reinforce research in a coordinated way in order to achieve the impact of malaria elimination so these are the four important steps taken by india to eliminate the menace of malaria and like i already said india plans to eliminate malaria by 2030 so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw holistically about malaria we covered everything we covered from its types we saw how we transfer from one human to another we saw the symptoms we saw the causes we even saw the vaccines that are in development and finally we saw the steps taken by india to counter it so i hope this discussion was useful so with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at these two articles displayed here here the first article is taken from the editorial page whereas the second article is taken from the text and context page both these articles are talking about the menstrual leave policies these articles came in the backdrop of 
Supreme Court's direction to a petitioner who earlier filed a public interest litigation in the Supreme Court. The petition had sought the Supreme Court's direction to the government to frame rules for granting menstrual pain leaves for students and working women. The Supreme Court said that providing menstrual leaves falls under the policy matter of the government. So, the Supreme Court directed the petitioner to approach the Union Ministry of Women and Child Development to frame a policy on menstrual pain leave. This is the reason these two articles about menstrual leave policies made news today. Now, what we are going to do is this. We will first understand in brief about the points given in this editorial. Then we will see in detail about the points provided in the text and context article. Now, we will first take the editorial article. The author of this editorial says that many barriers on the road to gender equality has been removed, but still there are many roadblocks. See, in India, the Maternity Benefit Act was enacted by the parliament in 1961. This act has been abandoned from time to time to give women better benefits. For instance, paid maternity leave has been extended from 12 weeks to 26 weeks. This was a positive move. But when it comes to menstrual leave, there is no clear-cut policies or laws that are available in India. The author says that this is one of the roadblocks to gender inequality. Because of this issue only, a petition was filed in the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court now directed the petitioner to approach the Union Ministry of Women and Child Development to frame a policy on menstrual pain leave. Apart from the menstrual leave, there are some other problems that are acting as roadblocks to women empowerment. This includes lack of sanitation facility in schools and workplaces, mainly in the informal sector. Some studies found that the girls are dropping out from school mainly because there is no toilets in the schools. And according to the World Bank data, between 2010 and 2020, the percentage of working women dropped from 26% to 19%. So, the lack of basic sanitation facility is also another major problem that hinders the progress of women. So, the author says that the wider society and the government should take responsibility to ensure that all constraints on the road to gender equality must be removed. This is all about the editorial given here. Now moving on, we will see about the points provided in the text and context article. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this topic is provided here. You can go through it. First, let us understand about the term menstrual leave. Menstrual leave refers to a set of policies that allow women employees or girl students to take leave when they are experiencing menstrual pain. If you take the workplace, Menstrual leave refers to policies that allow working women for both paid and unpaid leave or time for rest. Now moving on, let us see the data related to menstrual pain leave. Some studies are saying that more than half of women who menstruate experience pain for a couple of days in a month. But for some women, the pain is more than enough to hamper daily activities and productivity. In 2017, a survey was conducted among 32,000 women in Netherlands by the British Medical Council. The study found that 14% of the surveyed women had taken time off from work or school during their menstrual periods. Apart from this, some researchers estimated that women employees lost around 8.9 days worth of productivity every year due to menstrual cycle related issues. These data show the importance of granting menstrual leave to the women employees. Now moving on, let us see the issues associated with menstrual leave. See, not every menstruating woman is in favor of menstrual leave. Some women are thinking that the menstrual leave will lead to employer discriminating against women. For example, earlier a petition was filed by a law student in the Supreme Court. This petition highlighted the potential issues with the menstrual leave. The law student said that if employers are compelled to grant menstrual pain leave, it may act as a disincentive for employers to engage women in their establishment. For this petition, the Supreme Court observed that this issue has a policy dimension and the Supreme Court left it to the government to decide on this issue. So, the discrimination by the employer against women is the major issue associated with menstrual leave. Now moving on, let us see some of the global menstrual leave policies. On February 16, Spain granted paid menstrual leave to workers. 
so spain became the first european country to do such action the women workers in spain now have the right to 3 days of paid menstrual leave in a month and the leave may be extended to 5 days now coming to asia in 1947 Japan introduced menstrual leave as part of their labor law. Then Indonesia is also having menstrual leave policy. The policy states that women workers who are experiencing menstrual pain are not obligated to work on the first 2 days of their menstrual cycle. Apart from Indonesia, Philippines also granted 2 days of menstrual leave in a month to women. Now coming to the African countries. In Africa, Zambia introduced one day of leave in a month to the menstruating women. The women workers also need not state the reason or to produce medical certificate for claiming the leave. This is all about the global menstrual leave policies. Now what is the case in India? In India, the states such as Bihar and Kerala are the only two that have introduced menstrual leave policies for women. In 1992, the Bihar government has introduced its menstrual leave policy. This policy allows women employees to avail two days of paid menstrual leave every month. And recently, Kerala announced that it will grant menstrual and maternity leaves for students in universities. Apart from this, there are no major initiatives for menstrual leave in our country. To conclude, the Indian government should frame nationwide policies to grant menstrual leave to girl students and women employees. This will help to bring more women to the workforce and thereby increasing gender equality in our country. That is all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw in detail about the menstrual leave policy and the issues associated with it. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this news article. It says that Google LLC has refused to share crucial details to track the creators of Wonderloan mobile app. This app was available on Google Play Store and it cheated its users by threatening to share their private moments on social media. In this context, let us learn about digital lending, its significance and the issues associated with it. So what is this digital lending? Digital lending is the process of giving and recovering loans through web platforms or mobile apps. India's digital lending market has seen a significant rise over the years. Believe me or not, the digital lending value increased from 33 billion US dollars in financial year 2015 to 150 billion US dollars in financial year 2020 this is a rapid growth right even banks which were involved in traditional lending has launched their own digital lending platform so that they can tap the digital lending market now what are the significance of digital lending first is obviously financial inclusion Digital lending helps in meeting the huge credit need that to particularly in the micro enterprises and for the low income consumer segment in India. Secondly, it will reduce borrowing from informal channels and it also simplifies the process of borrowing. Thirdly, it is very time saving. It decreases the time spent on filing loan application in banks. So, digital lending platform could cut the overhead cost significantly. All sounds good. but there are some issues with this kind of platforms these platform charge excessive rates of interest and besides this there are additional hidden charges as well then they adopt unacceptable and high handed recovery methods for example certain lending apps are collecting our phone contacts media and gallery etc and they use this to harass borrowers in case of delay in repayment There are also data privacy issues as reported in this news article. See, while accepting the terms and conditions of these platforms, we as customers are generally not conscious of the fact that we are signing away our privacy rights. These companies collect many private data, including our financial records. Some digital lenders also misuse agreements signed by the users. they make use of the nuanced details of the agreement to cheat the customers these are some of the issues associated with digital lending process so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw what is digital lending the significance of digital lending and the issues associated with digital lending now let us conclude this and take up the next news article take a look at this text and context article it reports about the recent heat waves which has been recorded over delhi this month It further deals with the relation between El Nino and La Nina with the heat waves developing in India. 
the article distinguishes the heat waves occurring in india in two types one occurring over the northern and the northwestern part of our country and the other occurring in the peninsular part of the country this is about the article given here in this context let us see the points discussed in this article in detail the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it before seeing the contents present in the article let us first learn about the term heat waves the heat wave is a period of abnormally high temperature which lasts over 3 days in a particular region according to the indian meteorological department a region is said to be under a heat wave if its ambient temperature deviates by at least 4.6 to 6.4 degree celsius from its long term average here note that heat waves can be declared if the maximum temperature of the particular region crosses 45 degree celsius for plains and 37 degree celsius for hills this is about the term heat waves the article divides heat waves occurring in india into two types one is the heat waves occurring in the northern and the northwestern part of india while the second type is the heat waves occurring over the peninsular part of india this distinction is primarily based on the differences in the causes and the effects of the heat waves occurring in both these regions know that heat waves can be caused as a result of two major condition one is due to the flow of warm air from elsewhere while the other condition is due to local climate induced warming of the area this is how heat waves can occur in a specified region in india heat waves are predominantly reported as a result of warm air masses moving into it from adjacent areas now we will specifically look at the heat waves affecting the northern and northwestern part of our country the air masses causing heat waves in northern and northwestern part of india is generally due to air masses that originate far away from india the north and northwestern heat waves are typically formed as a result of air masses that come from 800 to 1600 km away on the way these air masses cover west asia and the mountains of pakistan and afghanistan which result in the air masses becoming drier and warmer the arabian sea due to its relatively high temperature when compared to other seas present in the same latitude also contribute to the increase in temperature of the incoming air masses this is how severe heat waves are formed in the northern northwestern regions of our country this mainly occurs during the time of march april and may now let us see about the heat waves of peninsular india the heat waves over peninsular india on the other hand arrive from the seas which are closer these air masses travel only about 200 to 400 km as a result of this the heat waves of peninsular india are less intense when compared to the northern heat waves this is all about the heat waves that occur over peninsular india Now before concluding our discussion let us see about the relation between el nino la nina and the heat waves of india one important point to note here is that during the years of el nino heat waves are generally limited to the northern and northwestern part of our country peninsular heat waves are uncommon during the el nino years also note that heat waves which occur during el nino years is generally harsher when compared to the heat waves that occur during the la nina years This is how El Nino and La Nina differently impact the intensity of heat waves that occur in India. With this we have come to the end of the discussion. Through this discussion we came to know about heat waves, what are the two types of heat waves affecting in India and finally we ended our discussion by seeing how El Nino and La Nina differently impact the intensity of heat waves that occur in India. Now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article. Yesterday in his 98th episode of Man Ki Baat our Prime Minister Narendra Modi said that experiments like the e sanjeevani application had ensured medical services to people living in remote areas of our country so what is this e sanjeevani application let us know more about them in the news article discussion e sanjeevani is the first ever online outpatient consultation service offered by the government of india to the citizens According to the government this is the first time the government of any country is offering a service of this kind to its citizens the scheme was started in November 2019 it is run by the ministry of health and family welfare the service is also called the national teleconsultation service its aim is to provide healthcare services to patients in their home itself 
so using this portal people can consult doctors online this is a completely web based system from patient registration to downloading of e prescription this is a completely free service launched by the government and the doctors of the portal are empaneled from the state services by each state government this telemedicine system is being deployed nationally under ayushman bharat scheme of government the e sanjeevini opd that is outpatient portal and the system are developed by the center for development of advanced computing which is located in mohali a few states like jharkhand kerala punjab and tamil nadu have started offering specialized doctor consultation service also this service is also available on the mobile application the process of consultation is given here for your reference you can go through it see the success of e sanjeevini lies very apparent because the application has crossed more than 8 crore tele consultations so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw some of the important facts about the e sanjeevani portal now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this article it says that the supreme court has directed the government to submit a report on the steps taken to end manual scavenging so in this discussion we will try to understand about the practice of manual scavenging in india and we will also try to understand about the judgment given by the court in the safai karmachari andolan and others versus union of india case see manual scavenging is the practice of removing human excreta by hand from sewers and septic tanks this is a inhuman sanitary practice India has banned this practice under the prohibition of employment as manual scavengers and their rehabilitation act 2013 this act bans the use of any individual from manual cleaning carrying disposing and handling human excreta however due to lack of enforcement of the act and exploitation of unskilled laborers the practice is still prevalent in india An important judgment with respect to manual scavenging in India is the Safai Karmachari Andolan and others vs Union of India case. In this case, a writ petition was filed by the petitioner as a public interest litigation. It asked for the writ of mandamus to be issued to the Union of India, Union territories and the state governments. The petitioners asked for a strict enforcement and implementation of the employment of manual scavengers and construction of dry latrines prohibition act 1993 so the court directed the government to rehabilitate manual scavengers mentioned under the act in a timely manner further the court directed the government to add some provision with regard to rehabilitation of manual scavengers here first with respect to sewer deaths the court said that entering sewer lines without safety gear should be made a crime even in emergency situations if such death occur compensation of 10 lakh should be given to the family of the deceased then with respect to railways the court said that railways should take time bound strategy to end manual scavenging on the tracks this is because indian railways is the largest employer of manual scavenger in the country then the court also said that the persons released from manual scavenging should not face hurdles to receive their legitimate due under the law then safai karmachari women should be provided with support for dignified livelihood in accordance with their choice of livelihood schemes then the court also held the compensation given by the government must include one time cash assistance scholarship to their children for education purposes residential plot with financial assistance for construction of houses job training and a monthly stipend subsidy and loan to one family member for taking alternative job on sustainable basis compensation of 10 lakhs to scavengers that have died during sewer work rehabilitation based on principle of natural justice so these are the conditions for compensation given by the supreme court in the safai karmachari and others was union of india case judgment okay the court also directed the government of the states and union territories to ensure compliance of the provisions of the act so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the safai karmachari versus union of india case judgment given by the supreme court with this we have come to the end of the news article discussion session now let us take up the practice prelims questions we have six practice prelims questions today let us see them one by one 
let us take up the first question this is a previous year question it appeared in the 2019 upsc prelims paper it is a three statement questions we have to find the correct statement the question is about maternity benefit amendment act 2017 let us take up the first statement pregnant women are entitled for 3 months of pre delivery and 3 months of post delivery paid leave this statement is incorrect because the maternity benefit amendment act 2017 provides for 26 weeks that is 6 months of paid maternity leave for women employees the maternity leave can be availed 8 weeks or 2 months before the expected date of delivery it is not 3 months before delivery so statement one is wrong moving on to the second statement enterprises with crutches must allow the mother minimum 6 crutch visit daily this statement is also incorrect the act mandates for establishing crutch facility at organizations that employ 50 or more employees as per the act women employees are permitted to visit the crutches four times during the day it is not six times so statement 2 is also incorrect moving on to the third statement women with two children get reduced entitlements this statement is correct women who are expecting delivery after having two children can avail only 12 weeks of paid maternity leave but up to two children the woman can avail 26 weeks of paid maternity leave so statement 1 is incorrect statement 2 is incorrect and statement 3 is correct so the correct answer here is option c 3 only moving on to the second question this is also a three statement question three statements about nbfc is given we have to find the correct statement look at the first statement nbfcs are incorporated under banking regulation act 1949 this statement is wrong because nbfcs are incorporated under the companies act 1956 so statement one is incorrect look at the second statement nbfcs doesn't need a bank license to operate this statement is correct and look at the third statement nbfcs cannot issue demand draft this statement is also correct nbfcs cannot issue demand draft they cannot have savings account and also they cannot issue checks or debit cards so statement 3 is also correct so the correct answer here is option d 2 and 3 only moving on to the third question this is a two statement question about upi light let us take up the first statement users can transact in off light mode through this service this statement is correct this is the primary objective behind the introduction of upi light using upi light users can transact in offline mode moving on to the second statement under this new mechanism upi transaction of up to rupees 1000 can be made by users without entering the pin this statement is incorrect the option for paying without a pin has been introduced for payments which are within rupees 200 only not 1000 so statement 2 is incorrect so the correct answer here is option a one only see there was also another new type of payment service introduced by upi called upi 123 now your job is to search the internet and find out what is this new service that is upi 123 all about okay now moving on to the next question this is a two statement question about e sanjeevani opd let us take up the first statement it is a doctor to doctor telemedicine system offered nationally by health and wellness centers from medical colleges and district hospitals this statement is incorrect actually e sanjeevani platforms support two types of telemedicine that is e sanjeevani which is doctor to doctor and e sanjeevani opd which is patient to doctor here the question is about e sanjeevani opd which is patient to doctor and not doctor to doctor as provided in this statement so statement 1 is incorrect moving on to the second statement e sanjeevani opd is an initiative of ministry of health and family welfare under ayushman bharat scheme from our discussion we know that this statement is incorrect e sanjeevani opd is an initiative of ministry of health and family welfare so statement 1 is incorrect and statement 2 is correct so the correct answer is 2 only moving on to the next question let me read out the question swachh bharat mission urban was launched by which of the following this is a very easy question the correct answer here is ministry of housing and urban affairs moving on to the last question this question is based on our neutrinos discussion this is a quiz question for you today interested aspirants can post the answer for this question in the comment section the main questions based on today's discussion are displayed here interested aspirants can write the answers and post them in the comment section if you like today's video like comment and share it with your friends 
For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IS Academy's YouTube channel. And thank you for listening.